when they scream their hate, when they scream their chants in Iran, for example, they say death to America first, and then they say death to Israel. What happened on October 7th was simply because of proximity, simply because they had the opportunity, but they absolutely want to do the same thing in America and in Europe and beyond. And if given the opportunity, they will. And yes, I have been warning about this for many years and I've been called an alarmist because people couldn't see what I could see. So when they were out for their Al-Quds rallies every single year in the streets of London and Toronto and every major city across the world, and they're screaming Khaybar Khaybar, I understand what that means. I understand that as the, that is a call for genocide of Jewish people, that they are talking about a genocide of Jewish people and that is what they are hoping will return again. But nobody reacted, nobody responded, and they continue to be empowered. Meanwhile, if you have far right wing KKK extremists in Charlottesville screaming Jews will not replace us or whatever other hate they were screaming, the response was correct. People knew how to respond to them, right? But when it's brown people from the Middle East, suddenly they can't say anything to them because that could be Islamophobic, that could be bigoted, that could be racist. And so that allowed these hateful people to just continue being empowered. So empowered, in fact, that the screams that are coming from Toronto and Vancouver and all sorts of other Montreal, not just all over my country, but all over the West, those chants that you're hearing are no different than the chants of Hamas the chants of Hezbollah, the chants of, of Al-Houthi. That's what they're chanting. They are not supporting Palestinians who are interested in progress, who are interested in education, who are interested in prosperity. They are supporting the Palestinians that are interested in terrorism and in the genocide of Jewish people. That's who they've chosen to support. There are, of course, many people in Gaza and in the West Bank who are not religious extremists. But those are not the people that have the power. Those are not the people that are getting UNRWA money. And those aren't the people that are getting international global support. Instead, the international global support is going to the extremists and therefore the extremists are the ones that are able to spread their ideology across the globe to the point that you have students in Columbia University in New York chanting the exact same chants as some terrorist in Lebanon. It is absolutely mind boggling. My guest today is Yasmin Mohammed. She's a prominent human rights activist, specifically women's, uh, Muslim women's rights, and a former. Al-Qaeda bride. She's also the author of Unveiled, How the West Empowers Radical Islam. Thank you very much for joining me today, Yasmin, to tell me your fascinating story. Thank you so much for having me. A number of years ago, you broke away from your family, uh, which you described as an extreme Islamist Al-Qaeda family. But life didn't start out that way for you. Your parents were actually very secular and open-minded. Your father is actually from Gaza. He was a peace activist who lived and engaged with um, Israelis and Jews. Your mother is from Cairo. Um, they met in Gaza when it was still under Egyptian rule. They eventually moved to Vancouver, where you were born. Um, but by the age of five to six years old, your life completely changes when your parents separate and your mother meets her second husband. And your life in Canada essentially becomes radicalized. Tell me a little bit about what that was like for you. So we, we went from being just a, a regular average Canadian family, as far as I knew, to suddenly this man entering our home and deeming everything haram. So haram is the Islamically forbidden things. And um, suddenly it was music as haram, dancing as haram, riding your bike as haram, swimming as haram, playing with your non-Muslim friends as haram, celebrating birthdays as haram. So 
pretty much everything that you can imagine a five to six year old little child would be interested in was deemed haram at that point. So I, I genuinely, you know, disliked this man. I disliked what he was doing to my mother. Suddenly my mom was in hijab. Um, none of it made any sense. None of it felt right. It felt very wrong. In fact, he would, my mom used to love listening to country music. And so our house always had records playing of like Dolly Parton, Hank Williams, Kenny Rogers. And he came and he took those records and he sat us down on the carpet and he started breaking my mom's records. And she stood there right next to him as he took these shards passed them to us and said, break them. So not only was he breaking my mom's things, but he was encouraging us to break my mom's things. And she just stood there and didn't react at all. So it was, it was pretty shocking for me to note that, you know, if I had walked if my, if my brother had walked into my room and started breaking my toys, I would have been livid, but my mom was just accepting it. And so that kind of set the tone for, you know, there's a new sheriff in town. He's going to be the one who's going to be controlling everything from now on. And my mother was not going to be protecting us or even protecting herself. And if you saw the way the mosques were when I was younger, like around five, six, seven, eight, the mosques were more like a community place where people went to go pray. And there was maybe, you know, there would be dinners every now and then and for Ramadan and things like that. And it slowly, slowly became that the imam of the mosque who was from India was fired and he was replaced by an imam from Egypt. And that imam's wife wore niqab and it's the first time we had ever seen anybody wearing niqab in our community. And as kids were running around and we're like, she's a, she looks like a penguin. She looks like a bat. Like we just thought it was hilarious that this woman was covered head to toe in black. We'd never seen anything like it. And everything started to change really slowly. The, the khutbah, the Friday sermons went from being more about, you know, things that were more general before, like you shouldn't lie, you shouldn't cheat, things like that. And it turned into very fire and brimstone, all about the infidels and the Jews and the Christians. And it was it was very us versus them, very angry. This trajectory of political Islam that started, you know, with the Muslim Brotherhood in the 1920s. And, you know, you can see it with the Islamic regime in Iran. You can see it in Afghanistan. You can see it in Pakistan. You can see it in Turkey. That trajectory started around that time, exactly as you describe it. And my mom's life, you know, she, her life followed that exact same trajectory and therefore so did ours. So she became much, much more radicalized at a time when everybody in the Middle East was becoming much more radicalized. And whereas you wouldn't have really seen hijab when my mom was growing up, suddenly everybody was wearing hijab. And that was a, it's sort of a, a physical signal for you to see how radicalized, how much more extremist people were becoming. And so your entire childhood from that age of, of six years old, when you enter this, this new family, your mother uh, enters this new marriage and your life is completely radicalized, um, oppressed, everything is forbidden. Um, that carries on into your teens. And by the age of 19 years old, you're actually forced into a marriage with an Al-Qaeda terrorist who had actually been working closely with bin Laden. That's correct. Yes. So I, there's quite a few different stories that I tell in my book um, about how when hijab was put on me, I would push back against it. When I was forced into Islamic schools and taken out of public schools, I pushed back against it. When I was um, being physically abused because of missing Quran or missing uh, prayers or not memorizing Quran properly, or as my family used to call it, wanting to be too Western. There is a lot of that happening throughout my childhood. So by the time I was 19, they felt that the best way to control me, that it was actually a choice. My mom said, we found a man who was strong enough to control you. And that's why they chose a terrorist. 
And suddenly I was the one who is in Naqab. Suddenly I was the one who was covered head to toe in black, imprisoned in my house, being beaten, being raped, and I couldn't say anything about it. I couldn't, who was I going to turn to? You know, it was when I would go to my mom and I would tell her, this man is beating me because I'm not wearing a hijab in the house on the 17th floor in an apartment building. She says to me, well, what did you, what religion did you think that you're a part of? Of course, he can beat you if he wants to. Have you not read Surat an nasa chapter four, verse 34? It's his right to beat you if he wants to beat you. So who are you going to go asking for support? Go, who are you going to go asking for help if the Almighty Allah has already sanctioned this and given this permission? So although it is true what you say that it, he is a he is a terrorist and he's currently in prison in Egypt, these ayahs in the Quran or these ahadith can be used as justification to bludgeon women all across the Muslim majority world and the Western world. I was in the Western world. These ideas don't have borders. They, they cross all sorts of borders. And even if a man is not as extreme as my ex-husband was, they can still take those verses and use them as justification to mistreat women. It certainly was a tactic by Hamas on October 7th when they unfortunately raped and took women and young girls hostages um, using that, that verse of the Quran, misinterpreting it uh, to use it f for their advantage. Um, but I want to turn back to this life that you had in Canada in the 1990s. You are completely radicalized, forced, essentially completely cut off from, from the outside world. Um, and soon after your marriage, you become a mother. Um, you're living in Canada. Your, your former Al-Qaeda terrorist husband uh, and your newborn daughter. Um, and your husband brings up female genital mutilation. Um, and I, I want to get from you, first of all, um, a little bit of an explanation as to why he brings that up and what it triggered in you. you know, at that point in my life, I didn't have the courage to fight for myself. I'd always been thinking and hoping that or wishing that there might be a better life for myself, but I didn't have the bravery that it would have taken to free myself. But when I had my little daughter and I felt so much love and so much desire to protect her, and when he started talking about taking my perfect little baby girl to Egypt to get her genitals mutilated with razor blades, that's the moment that I realized I have to get her out of here. I have to find the courage to fight for her. How common of a practice is female genital mutilation? It is unfortunately very common in Egypt, which is where he's from, where my mother's family is from. At the time, it was close to 90% or even higher than 90%. Now it's been criminalized and that's come down a little bit, not too significantly, um, but it has been reduced. In my family, in my mother's family, it wasn't a practice, but in his family, it was. And rather than my mother helping me to push back against him, she immediately embraced it and said, oh, no, 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 we're not going to do that now because she's too young. We'll take her when she's older, when she's like, you know, five, six, seven years old. We'll take her to Egypt and we'll get it done. So my mom was going to be his ally in mutilating my daughter. So that's why I knew I had to get away from both him and her. And how did you manage to escape? I didn't leave fast enough. And because a Muslim woman is not allowed to say no to her husband when he wants to sleep with her, she does not have that right because he is her property. And so I ended up getting pregnant again. And when I got pregnant that second time, it's almost like I submitted finally. I gave up. I said, well, this is it. How am I ever, with a high school education and two children, how am I ever going to survive? 
So I have to just accept this is my fate. This is my life. I'm going to become, you know, a terrorist wife and just make babies until I die. And then when I went for an ultrasound, we found that the baby didn't have a heartbeat. And so then, of course, I'm flooded with emotions because I'm feeling like this is my fault because I didn't want the baby. And that's why this happened. And I blamed myself. And it was a very difficult time. But I was also very aware that I have a very small window of opportunity. And so when they sent me to go and get the DNC surgery, the nurse told me, you're going to need some time after because you're going under general anesthetic. So you're going to need, need some time after for somebody to help you take care of your daughter. And so I told him, I'm going to need a week where someone's going to have to help me with my daughter. So I need to go stay with my mom for a week. And so, of course, he agreed to that because it's not like he's going to help me with the baby for a week. And so when I went and stayed with my mom, it was purely because I believed it would be easier to get away from her than it would be to get away from him. I knew my mom's schedule. She was the head of the Islamic Studies Department at the Islamic school that I used to attend. And so I knew that she would leave the house at a certain day and she would return or at a certain time and she would return at a certain time. And I knew that I had that short window to find myself a lawyer and to get full custody, to get a restraining order and to get a divorce from this man before the week was up. And so that's what I did. So in those days, there was the yellow pages. So I, I went flipping through the yellow pages, found a lawyer who was close by, who was willing to take me for that first consultation of a half an hour for free. And I, it had to be a woman, of course, because at that time I wasn't speaking to men and found one, grabbed my daughter in full niqab, got on the bus, got to this lawyer and asked her for these three things. And before I even finished talking, because of course I was panicked the whole time because I need to get back home. Before I even finished talking, she placated me and said, everything's gonna be okay. I'll take care of this. Don't worry, everything's fine. And I, there was no cell phones back in these days. Well, at least I didn't. There were cell phones, but I didn't have one. And so I said to her, you can't phone my mom's house. You know, if any of the information, if you need anything else from me, like I have to call you this, you know, what are we going to do? And she said, just don't worry about it. I'll deal with it. I've got all the information that I need. And like a guardian angel, that's exactly what she did. And a few days later, in fact, it was the fifth out of seven days, the fifth day, he came to my mom's apartment screaming in Arabic, <sighs> you know, just cursing me, demanding that he get his wife back, threatening me. And I called 911. And at that point, the police were like, yes, we're fully aware. We've gotten many phone calls. Um, so luckily he wasn't let into the building. And um, the reason why that happened was, of course, because he had been served with the divorce papers. And one of the things that he screamed at me was, you can get your Canadian divorce all you want. At the end of the day, you're still Islamically married to me. And when I go to heaven, I'm going to ask for you to be my wife and you're going to be with me for eternity. There's no escape. And because I really believed at that time all of this to be true, I honestly felt like I was only gonna have a few years of reprieve and then I would be back um, being married to him. It's a, a harrowing story to hear and you're very brave for, for going through with it and, and finding a way to escape. And I wanna thank you so much for, for sharing your story um, with us today. And I wanna talk about a little bit how that experience as a woman um, has inspired you in your work as a human rights activist, specifically for women today? The women in Israel and what they've had to endure because of Hamas, we're still hearing stories right now where women are coming forward and sharing the kinds of things that happened to them. I have been hearing stories like that, unfortunately, for so many years. 
women, you know, whether it's Christian women in Nigeria, whether it's Hindu women in Pakistan, whether it's British women, you know, in London, these stories are happening all over the world. And then, of course, there's the Muslim women who are the first victims of these Islamic extremist men. Those stories are, are countless. And it just is such a difficult... Listen, to give you an example of how difficult it is for women to speak, in Afghanistan now, they have a law that women's voice cannot be heard. And the reason why they have that law is because it's based on Sharia. It's based on Islamic law that says a woman's voice is aura. That means a woman's voice is shame, it's nakedness. Women should neither be seen nor heard. We should be covered up in black and we should not be speaking. Definitely not speaking for ourselves, definitely not advocating for ourselves, definitely not feeling any sense of autonomy or independence or you know, any kind of, 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 of self, you know, you, you really, as a Muslim woman, do not have any sense of self whatsoever. You belong to, you belong to your father, you belong to your husband, you yourself are not a full human being. And because I lived that, and I was able to get out of that, I intimately understand how difficult that path is. And I'm fully aware of how many millions of women are in the exact same position that I was in and they can't speak. They can't speak because I'm privileged to have gotten out of that environment that I was in and to be in a safe environment where I can now be a voice for the voiceless. But women in Iran, women in Pakistan, women in Sudan, women in Somalia, women in Egypt, women in Jordan, women all over these countries, they can't speak. The honor violence, the honor killings, we don't even have the numbers for how prevalent these things are for the smallest infractions. And so once I got free, I was overcome with survivor's guilt. And I felt like I can't just move forward and enjoy my life. I have to support these women that I know are suffering in silence. And so that's what I try to do with my work. When we're talking about that selective activism, when it comes to human rights, one of the biggest uh, disappointments has been from the feminist movement. Um, I, I want to ask you, how did we get to a point where, where so-called Western feminists remain silent on the rape of women based on their religion and ethnicity? There should be no ambiguity here whatsoever. I do not understand it. We saw what happened with the Yazidi women in Iraq. We know what these extremists do to non-Muslim women because they, according to their Quran, they can take these women as sex slaves. They can use these women. We have video upon video upon video of the men themselves talking about what they did to these women in Israel. And still, it was, forget, we have the one of the first images that I saw on October 7th was of Shani Luke on the back of that truck. We all saw that. That is what shook the whole world that video that they took themselves and shared with the world. So how can you, as a human being, forget as a fellow woman, how can you as a human being see that and then somehow find a way to excuse or defend or to pretend that this isn't happening when you saw it with your own two eyes? And the useful idiots in the West do the work of these extremists, hide the sins of these extremists. I don't remember, I think it took eight months for UN women to finally condemn what happened on October 7th to the women in Israel. It's absolutely shocking. It never should have been a conversation. As I said, there's no moral ambiguity here. It was very clear. We know what these extremists do to women. It was absolutely no surprise 
that they would do that to the women in Israel. But the way the international community reacted was just absolutely heinous and inexcusable. You've made it your life mission to speak out against the, the, the crimes of radical Islamism, specifically when it comes to women and, and the oppression that Muslim women within that circle of radicalism, I'm not talking about, um, you know, secular Muslim women, but I'm talking about radicalism. Are you ever afraid mm -hmm. about your stance and speaking out publicly? Yes, of course. I've, I've, I knew before I spoke publicly for the first time that this was a huge risk. You know, I was married to a member of Al Qaeda. I'm very aware of, of extremists. Um, but I'm also very aware that they control the narrative in Muslim majority countries through imprisoning people, torturing people, executing people. That's what they do to people in Muslim majority countries. And so I felt compelled. I'm in a position where they can't speak over there. They won't speak over here. And so I have to speak. There's going to be so few people that are going to be able to speak, that are going to be in a position in their lives where they will feel safe enough and comfortable enough to tell the truth. There is so much risk involved. There's so much risk involved with making decisions about your own personal body. If you make a personal decision about wearing hijab or not, you could be putting your life in danger. So of course, going public and speaking the truth about any topic is going to get you into so much trouble. And so I felt that I had to, I had no choice. And my hope is that more and more and more people will start to speak up. And so then it will be less dangerous for those of us who are doing it right now. Yes, Mean Mohammed, thank you very much for taking the time today to share your your fascinating and inspiring story and, and for the huge work that you do to give the voice back to these women that have been silenced throughout the Middle East. And thank you for, for providing your perspective and some insight uh, onto what you've experienced and what have thousands of other women in the Middle East and around the world are experiencing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah.